I should at, at the very first say that I was honored to be asked to give a keynote for this conference for Koichi. Uh, though I will admit that I was a little less honored when I discovered that I'd have to get up at five o'clock in the morning to do so. But still, it is perhaps appropriate because I think of all of the people um, connected with the conference, I've probably known Koichi the longest. Um, we I met almost 50 years ago. That's 5-0. Uh, when I was a, gra a new graduate student at McMaster University, and Koichi came, as I think Bob Scharf mentioned, uh, something uh, as, as something of an accidental hire uh, in Chinese Buddhist studies. He, he, when I first met him, he was a very, very Weber scholar, but I knew him then, and he spent a little bit of time at a lovely old farm that I lived on when I was a student at McMaster. And then years later, <clears throat> our lives intersected again in Tokyo, of all places, where I was spending a year and Koichi was on a leave of absence for a year. And I got to spend some time with him there. And I got to know his family. And there was a photograph of his family uh, in the uh, video. Uh, and unless I'm much mistaken, much of what was said about Koichi could probably have been said about his father. They, they seem to be very much alike. Um, quiet, somewhat reserved, great sense of humor, and incredibly perceptive. Um, um, and Koichi hasn't changed much, as far as I can tell, he's still very much that. In any case, um, <clears throat> it is, as I said, uh, my pleasure to present this paper in honor of Koichi, uh, although probably not to his surprise, it's uh, not exactly in East Asian studies, but it does, I hope, present an alternative view or a different kind of esoteric conception of images. Image processions seem to have been relatively common in early and medieval China. References to them in one form or another have in fact been noted in a variety of literary sources. Whether the same was true of India, however, has been less clear and the evidence for image processions in India was ironically almost exclusively Chinese until re recently. That evidence was first of all from Fa Xian's fourth, fifth century account of his journey to the West. He noted elaborate Buddhist image processions at famously Khotan, but also in central India. Although the latter has not received so much attention, Xuanzang too observed image processions in two places during his seventh century travels, in Kucha uh, <clears throat> and in Kanyakubja, also in central India. These two accounts were for a very long time the only easily available or known sources for Buddhist image processions in India until recently. The sources noted more recently are in Indian Vinaya texts. Virtually all the sources for image processions in, in, in India that have been pointed out more recently belong to the Mula Savasavatan Vinaya tradition and therefore predate the Chinese travel accounts by at least two centuries and probably several more. There is not just one, but two separate sets of rules on image processions that for this tra tradition are canonical. Both are now found in the sections, in, in sections of the Wula Savasavatan Vinaya Uttara Grantha. It is likely that both were <clears throat> originally separate and independent works or at least circulated independently. And there is a good chance that both 
are relatively old. Although, as we will see, Guna Prabha treats the second of these sets of rules as if it referred to an image of the Buddha, it does not. It refers to what, <clears throat> to what it calls, quote, the image of one sitting in the shade of the Jambu tree, a named image that is referred to uh, on more than one occasion uh, in this video, and that this tradition identifies as an image of the Bodhisattva Siddhartha, the only Bodhisattva it knows. The first set of rules also does not refer to a Buddha image per se. Gunaprabha puts it under the heading Bodhisattva Pratima Karana. And this does not mean making a Bodhisattva image, but making an image of the Bodhisattva. Both these Bodhisattva images, however, are referred to and addressed as if they were the Buddha himself. So Guna Prabha is not doing anything very remarkable or even unjustified. This canonical usage, on the other hand, would seem to place these uh, canonical rules in a period where there was or was still some hesitancy about making the image of the Buddha but images of the Bodhisattva or images that were called that were already in use. Just such images are frequently referred to in the inscriptions from Matura and the Bhikshu Bala records and very commonly found in the corpus of Gandharan art. The elaborate rules on image processions occur that elaborate rules on image processions occur in two separate places in the canonical vinya is Mula Savastava and vinya is striking. But equally striking is the apparent fact that such rules do not occur in any other vinya at all. At least none have been cited. And there have been at least three separate surveys of references to art and images in vinyas preserved in Chinese that should have found them if they were there. Soper, for example, gives several references to image possessions in Chinese monasteries and nunneries, but says, quote, the basic idea of the image procession was, of course, Western, i.e. India. In his entry on Butsozu, uh, Demeville had even earlier cited numerous Vinaya passages bearing on images, almost all of them are Mula Safasivatan, and there is nothing about image processions in any of the others or in other references he cites. Even the most recent of the three surveys has produced, uh, has produced, has not, sorry, has not produced anything certain, although it came close. Zuzer cited a passage from Taisho 1452, which is the Chinese, Chinese translation corresponding to what in Tibetan is the Nidana section of the Uttara Grantha. The passage he cites appears in fact to represent the passage in the Chinese text that corresponds to the first set of rules on processions in the Tibetan. The latter has unmistakable reference to making quote, a circuit of the region with the image of it being carried into town on a palanquin and a cart. But almost all of this has been omitted or lost in the Chinese translation. What is there is paraphrased by Sutra. He says, the passage allows that the image, quote, be moved in and out, bracket, during processions, question mark, bracket, in a carriage. The bracketed query is sutras. So what could have been a clear vinya warrant in Chinese appears to have been lost or garbled in translation. What all this means is in one way pretty straightforward. <clears throat> the apparent absence of any reference to image processions in other vinyas, but two detailed sets regarding them in the Mula Savastavatan vinya would seem to indicate 
that it, at least in this case, is far more representative than any other video of what both Fa Xian and Xuanzen uh, saw actually being practiced in India. And, it, and they date what they saw centuries earlier. But determining the shelf life and the reach of these rules is also important. The first thing to be noted in that regard is that the canonical Mula Savastavatan Vinaya is not the only Mula Savastavatan source where rules on image processions are found. The, there are also a number of later Mula Savastavatan monastic handbooks where such rules are repeated, elaborated upon, added to, or quietly modified. In fact, a whole series of such handbooks, and these may have been much more widely known and used than even the canonical Vinaya. There is first of all Gunaprabha's remarkable Vinaya Sutra, and it gave rise to four substantial commentaries. Then there is Vishakadeva's Vinaya Karika and the Vinaya Samgraha of Vaishesha Mitra. Most of these sources cannot be dated precisely, <clears throat> but are certainly medieval and, are pro and probably stretched over a long period of time that goes from the fifth century on. The first of these handbooks, Gunaprabha's Vinaya Sutra, does little more than repackage the text of the canonical rules. It modifies or adds little, and even that subtly, but it eliminates virtually all narrative elements and reduces the text to a series of bare, terse rules. Since the canonical texts are now easily available in translation, but Gunaprabha's text is not, a translation of a part of it at least will allow the modern reader to see how Gunaprabha worked and to see what they the early medieval reader saw in reading him. The reader of Gunaprabha would have given, been given the following instructions in regard to image processions. Quote, an image of the Buddha should be made. For it, a festival should be held. Festivals also for the birth, the first hair cutting, the cutting off of the hair and beard, and the awakening all moments in the, in the Bodhisattva's life. It should be taken into town. Here, it is proper for a monk to carry it. That obligation falls on a junior monk, of course. The five groups should follow in attendance. The respectful offerings for a guest, i.e. the donations, should be received by a senior monk. For it, musicians should make music and other great honors are good. For the sake of ordering the music to be performed, it is unobjectionable to say, ho oh, man, perform the honors for the teacher. On highways, streets, crossroads, and forks, a written announcement that it will take place on the next day or the day after next must be proclaimed. Likewise, in a written announcement on birch bark, on the back of an elephant surrounded by umbrellas, flags, and banners, saying the Buddha is coming to town, is to be proclaimed. The canonical text that Guna Prabha is digesting does not, however, stop here. That's the end of the quote. <clears throat> and neither does he. With no break in between, the text shifts from the need to advertise the procession to the very abundant donations or proceeds that it generates. There is first a section which dealt with whether the nuns got a share. They do not. And the Buddha himself is made to declare that it is a serious offense if the nuns set out a separate wagon to do so. <clears throat> Then follows a final section that might surprise some, but which points with no hesitation to the economic importance of such processions. <coughs> Excuse me. Here the Buddha determines how the proceeds that result from the procession must be handled. 
and he gives the rules governing what can only be called a monastic auction. The monastic auction, by the way, is another Indian development that had a long history in China. Gunaprabha duly treats both sections. Although Gunaprabha characteristically treats the canonical material without admitting anything of significance except narrative, he does not always treat it in the canonical order. And this can result in a subtle but significant alteration. So it is in this case. He treats the first part of the text on image processions we are dealing with at the very end of his Vinaya Sutra, but the second part of the text 30 pages earlier. There, starting with the words mahante, which contextually can only mean at the end of a festival, not at the end of the festival. And after saying that it is a serious offense if the nuns set out a second wagon for donations, he says, quote, the distributor of vessels, a monastic officer, must divide them. He must be appointed. There is to be a selling of those items that are to be sold. It is to be in the midst of the assembled community. It is to be done by auction. For that there, an assembly must be accomplished. The elder of the community must determine the price. It must be moderate. By that, it does not fall on him. When it no longer rises, the price, having made it certain, it falls on the bidder. One who is not buying must not raise the price. That is to say, artificially bid it up. Of the four Indian commentaries on the Vinaya Sutra, um, the most informative is Dharma Mitra's and attention is focused here on it. Like most commentaries, change and innovation occur if they do occur in the guise of glosses in Dharma Mitra. He, for example, glosses Gunaprabha's, it is proper for a monk to carry it with quote, it is proper for a monk to carry the palanquin and so forth. There is of course no mention of a palanquin in either the canonical text delivering this set of rules uh, or in Gunaprabha, but both palanquins and carts are explicitly mentioned in the other set of rules and one or both could easily be assumed. Dharma Mitra's gloss of, the res of quote, respectful offerings for a guest by cloth and ornaments and so forth is also an easy assumption. <clears throat> if it is kept in mind that the cloth and ornaments are not for the image itself, but as we will see, small donations and pieces of jewelry that presumably the monks could sell at auction and convert into cash. Of an altogether different order, however, is his gloss of and other great honors. Dharma Mitra says this means that the procession should be made lovely, quote, by those who have taken on the appearance of gods, dispersing flowers, dispersing clothes, cloths and ornaments, sons of gods waving fans, divine maidens dancing, Gandharvas playing cymbals, Kumbandas making hymns of praise. And <clears throat> this would have made an impressive parade with players, dancers and singers in apparently divine disguises and costumes. But sets of canonical rules refer of course to music. Both, oh, sorry, both sets of canonical rules refer of course to music. And the second set makes it explicit that the monks themselves were not to make the music, but were only to direct the musicians. But neither set contained anything like this elaborate description. And yet it is not hard to imagine that there is what if that this is what image processions looked like in Dharma Mitra's day, the eighth or ninth century, or that they would have attracted enormous crowds, even the comparatively restrained and event described in the first set of rules. 
is said to have attracted monks, nuns, and lay brothers and sisters, and others who resided in many regions and who had assembled in very great numbers. <clears throat> Dharma Mitra confirms Gunaprabha's shifting of the location of the rules on monastic actions, auctions, which are found at the end of the second text, and which deny a share of the proceeds to the nuns and require their sell by action. The significance of Gunaprabha's move then becomes even more obvious as a result. By simply relocating or repositioning those rules, Guna Prabha, follow, uh, followed by Dharma Mitra, has expanded considerably their reach. In their original position, they applied only to image processions. In their new position, they now <clears throat> apply to all mahas or festivals, including, of course, image processions. But if Guna Prabha and Dharma Mitra wanted these rules on auctions to apply to all, mahas or festivals, they must have known or expected that all of them would generate significant proceeds that would require conversion into cash. This moreover seems to have been the case. Everywhere in this code, festivals generate funds and were undoubtedly meant to do so. However important Gunaprabha's repositioning and consequent generalizing of the rules, originally at the end of the second text, have been or seen, not everyone did the same. In another monastic handbook, Vishaka Deva's Vidya Karika, for example, the rules on image processions and auctions are still directly linked, the second coming immediately after the first. The first few verses of the Sanskrit might be rendered, quote, by the Lord of the world, it was said that the entrance of the image of the Buddha into towns is for allay, allaying the difficulties of the regions. Then the streets and crossroads are aspersed and well swept, <clears throat> the ground made beautiful with various sorts of flowers, incense with sandalwood, aloe, and camphor is to be offered. These are then followed by verses on the sounds and music, that accompany the procession, the banners and so forth. Then, and a great collection with householders and renunciations is to be displayed. Such things are to be effected for the entrance of the all-knowing. As a result of that, all yakshas, nagas and so forth, they're thought delighted by the sight of it, i.e. the procession, with the Buddha at the head, the image, destroy the fear born from these difficulties. In selling, no break, in selling the resulting donations in the midst of the community, the elder of the community must determine a price by examining the goods. It is proper for whoever who certainly wishes to buy to raise the price, but it is not proper to make use of it when the full price has not been paid. Notice here first that Vishaka Devas presents the procession as undertaken to allay the difficulties of the regions. Without saying what these are, Upadrava typically refers to famine, plague, oppression, eclipse, etc. This emphasis is not found elsewhere, but even it does not change the fact that he also indicates that image processions generate donations that are to be sold at auction and turned into ready cash. For Vishaka Deva, then, the image procession is both a ritual of appeasement or protection and a money-making activity. There are a number of other points of interest here and elsewhere that could be pursued, but this is not the place for it. For the moment, however, it can be said that even a brief and incomplete survey of material bearing on image processions in the Mula Savastavat Vinaya, uh, <clears throat> like the one un undertaken here, would seem to allow some broader and more general observations. The first of these might simply be that there is such material, that the Mula Savastavat Vinaya not only contains material, 
on image processions, but may be the only canonical Vinaya text that does. The latter needs to be fully confirmed. But if it is, then this would be another case, like those involving permanent endowments or inscribing donations, where this Vinaya is the only one to refer to things that we know were widely practiced in India. Indeed, if nothing else, this Mula Savastavatan material finally provides Indian evidence for image processions in Indian Buddhist monastic communities. A second observation might be that material on image processions in Mula Savastavatan sources is not limited <coughs> uh, to its canonical vinaya. It occurs in a series of monastic handbooks and commentaries that have, appear to have been composed over a very long time, as late as the 14th century, perhaps. A third observation is that the image processions that Mula Savastava literary sources knew have on the whole considerable similarity with what Vashien saw, <clears throat> but there are also significant differences. Fashian, for example, says the images he saw were carried on elaborate cars, which he describes in some detail. But Muller Savastavatan literary sources know nothing of them. However, one of the most significant differences may be that the Vinaya sources consistently link the procession with the proceeds it generates, and Fashian does not. He does not mention the economic aspects of the processions he witnessed at all, nor any appeasement function. And as an outsider, or as it were, a member of the audience, he may have been completely unaware of them. The value of the Mula Savastavatan sources then may be in part, may be in part that they re represent, and that rather candidly, the ins an insider's point of view, where an outsider sees pageantry or religious fervor, the insider sees a source of funds. Certainly this tradition does not shy away from econo economic matters and is equally candid about another fundraising procedure that it seems to have developed. The image procession, in fact, was not the only organized procedure in which Buddhist monks engaged in actively pursuing donations, according to this Vinaya. They also, the monks, repeatedly undertook what are called Chandaka Bhikshanas, or free will offerings, which also involved advertising the event in advance, going through the town on an elephant, music, etc., all to raise money. But that's another story, and that must be saved for Koichi's 90th birthday. Thank you. <laughs>